Wait, welcome everyone to this edition of Book Talk. I'm Annie Stanley. I'm an educator here at the Art Museum. And today I'm joined by Patty George and Irene Perry. And this is the book we're going to be discussing. It's called The Creative Spark by Michael Shapiro. And a little bit of background. One of the reasons we thought this would be a fun book to do, um, I'd actually seen an interview. Uh, there's a bookstore in California that was doing um, having authors interview each other and he um, was one of the people that was part of this program and he was talking about this book I guess this was his latest book that he had out he has another book that's all about travel the creative spark is nonfiction it's interviews with 32 different um, musicians authors um, um, who else there's artists um, pretty broad range of people that he talked to and a lot of these were done earlier for like Rolling Stone. So these were interviews that he was doing for magazines. Um, and I'm sure, some of them I'm sure were original for this book, but it's been over several years. And usually he'll start off when he's talking about the interview with wh where he met that person or how, you know, I interviewed them in 2014 and then I saw them again in 2017. Um, the underlying theme that they talked about, which made it interesting to me, was he said of everyone that he talked to, whether it was an author or a musician, artist, um, cooks, that people who had achieved a pretty high level of success, the reoccurring theme was hard work. <laughs> it was not just, oh, they're so naturally talented. It was that they get up every day and they have a process. They have a really strong work ethic. Um, so what did you guys think, just in general terms, before we talk about specific interviews, um, what, did, what did you think about the book? Did you find that to be true? I kind of found a similar, a similar theme throughout of a lot of the ones with sustainability or just going back and, and not so much technology progression, but a lot of it, even musicians, the chefs, the writers, just uh, sustainability. How about you, Irene? Well, you know, and also along with that sustainability, you know, a progression, you know, it, they aren't always doing the same thing. And I like the point you made, Annie, about um, several times there was more than one interview in the, in the lifetime of that relationship. And he kind of talks about the different settings where he talked to them. But I love the opening quote from um, Bob Dylan. Um, life isn't about finding yourself or finding anything. It's about creating yourself and creating things. And so I liked that um, theme. And I didn't notice that till I was looking through the book, getting ready for this discussion. So I thought right, that was so question. Did you all read it beginning to end? How did you read this book? I read beginning to end. Okay. Just, I'm kind of anal that way. <laughs> Well, I started beginning to end, and then last weekend, I was only halfway through. And so then I started skipping through ones I wanted to see, and I read the last one. Um, and then when Annie sent me the list of the six, there was two I hadn't read, and so I went and read those two. Yeah, and I completely skipped around, which is not usually how I obviously read books, but I kind of, I got started, um, and then there were people that I knew were going to be in there, and I'm like, I think I'll jump ahead and read that one. So I think I eventually read every chapter, but I just didn't read it in chronological order. Yeah, and that doesn't matter. It doesn't, no. And I would like to go back and reread some because I've been probably reading this book off and on. I was reading fiction while I was reading this. And so when did I start? Maybe after Christmas. Um, and so some of it was not as fresh as the more recent things. And so I, I thought this would be a fun book to reread. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I noticed some of the chapters, he has a wildly different <laughs> length of chapters. Some are really short yes. and some are pretty yes. long. Yes, yes. And some the ones that I really liked, I would turn the page and I'd be, oh, we're done. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> I was curious about the order that they're in. If there was, I didn't notice any kind of logic or progression, but I love Pico Iyer being the first one. I really liked that. That's the one, one that I would like to talk about too. Yeah, I, I hope there wasn't an, an order that you were supposed to read these in because obviously I was, disobeying that <laughs> if, that he did, if he wanted that I wasn't following along maybe next time when I read it, read it I'll start from the beginning and read it that way um okay let me just make sure I don't miss my questions here 
Um, let's go ahead and talk about, uh, pick one of the interviews in particular, and let's let's kind of go through and, and talk about some of the, what stood out to you. Um, I will plant a little seed, you know, the, the title is The Creative Spark. And when I'd heard about the book and they talked a lot about the creative process, but I found there was kind of a, a deeper underlying theme that wasn't necessarily about creativity. In my mind, it was more just about living your life, just success as a human being, being happy. Um, but who would like to go first and pick one of the, the chapters that you want to speak about? Well, let's start with Pico Iyer. He's, at okay. the He's your favorite. And then we'll go to one of my favorites. Uh, well, when I heard he was in here, I was super excited because I just read a book about a year ago that he wrote um, called Autumn Light, Season of Fire and Farewells. Have you, you read that also? Had you read that, Patty? Yeah, yeah. We'd all read that. Um, that was a, a previous book club book that we did for the museum. And that book, it was when I read the interview with him, um, I didn't some of this I remembered from his book, but some of it was completely um, new to me. Um, he's lived in, he's uh, lived, was born in Britain, has lived in Northern California, but he's lived mostly off and on in Japan for the last 31 years. His wife is Japanese. He could have a visa because he's a spouse, but he keeps a tourist visa because he said, I feel like a tourist. He, he really has never learned Japanese. Uh, and when he is in Japan, and this is part of what ha helps him with his creative process, he said he doesn't have a cell phone. They don't have TV. Um, they, I don't even think they have newspapers. And he talked about for him, the idea of like, um, and I think he even made this analogy, like when you go on vacation and you're in a completely new environment, and we all think about this where you're not in your house, so you don't have your normal chores and things that you need to do. When he's in Japan, he's almost emptied out because there's no distractions. Um, and he's, I love the story. He said, um, if my wife wants to tell me about her childhood as a girl in Japan, I can listen for four hours. Nothing's going to beep in. Nothing's going to interrupt us. And that kind of lends itself to his writing. So he's just completely undistracted by anything. And, and, he, and, and the language. Yeah. Yes. Something I liked in there, he's talking about Japan. Because my first introduction to Pico Iyer was that book, Autumn Light, and I just loved it. I loved the way it felt, and um, and I didn't realize it was nonfiction when I read it um, until we had the discussion, because I wasn't really paying attention. I just read it. <laughs> anyway, he talks about the creative activity in Japan. I'm on page 14 if you want to read with me. Um, it's really about sifting and minimalizing, making things as spare as possible. Partly because that is how you spark creativity in a reader. So it wasn't just about him. It was about that relationship. And he talked about how there's like space on the page. And I remember that in that book. It was just really calm. And I really enjoyed that. And I, I didn't think of it as being a conscious effort on the part of the writer. And I liked that. I liked that. Because I really like the Japanese aesthetic. And um, I could use some more KonMari in my life. It's <laughs> behind me. So. <laughs> Those of you who might be interested, um, Autumn Light, it, it is nonfiction. It's about the season, Autumn, in Japan. But it's also about death. It's about um, his father-in-law um, being elderly and dying. Um, and, and just how, kind of contrast the difference between how Japanese culture views death and dying and maybe how Americans do that that is definitely part of it but it's not a it's not a sad book I mean it's it's bittersweet but you guys you don't did you think it was sad I didn't think no. it was sad but it's very love, very calm for sure I love the the small town yes that he's in and the characters in the small town and, yeah. and I'm so glad I read that before reading this interview with him because he's he's very diverse though also he says he's a different person when he goes back to California and I think London doesn't he also he have a place grew up there yeah he also lived in New York for a while right but yeah and I one thing like that kept coming up both in um, the, this interview and then I also had, had read some other things about him is that he's so generous He's someone that when you're trying to interview him, he's actually flipping and trying to ask you questions because he's really more interested in other people than talking about himself. 
Um, mm-hmm. and, and very complimentary. The, the author said when he finished, he had actually had some rough things going on that week. And when he finished his interview with him, he felt really buoyant because he's such a happy person. And he complimented him and told him what a good job he did interviewing him. And, um, really sweet. Probably a, a writer's, um, I guess anytime you interview a writer, they're probably, they so look to a character that they want to maybe draw a character out of you or see what you're all about. And the David Sedaris does that too. I know when they said about David Sedaris, when he is signing books, he'll ask <laughs> you a question rather than, you know, so that maybe that's a writer's portrait. Yeah. After I finished the chapter, I went and watched, I think it was a TED Talk or some kind of interview of him because I wanted to see what he sounded like. And he had that same feel in his voice and his mannerisms. I enjoyed that. Who else? Who else should we talk about? Okay, so one of my favorites is Jane Goodall. Um, Ah. So I teach science, biology, and I remember watching Jane Goodall documentaries as a kid in school. And um, so she is an icon of mine. And I, she has a, there's a new documentary, maybe a couple new ones out on the Nat Geo channel about her that came out this last year. So I watched them during the, the thick of the pandemic in the spring. And the theme of hope, you know, and that's the title of her um, chapter here. And that's when I got my pencil out for the first time reading this book. And there was things I had to underline and to mark and to, and to look at, and I really liked that. Um, I'm trying to see what I actually marked in here in these pages. It's a long one. Oh, um, nature is really resilient when you give her a chance. Um, I like that optimism about that. Um, And about the importance of personal choices and collective individual personal choices can make a difference in our world. So I like that hope and optimism overall in her theme of nature. And I thought that really came out in this, in the interview that they did with her. So I liked Jane Goodall. I loved when they were talking about um, observations that she made. I think it was like in the, in the sixties when they first, uh, well, they, they came upon some chimps that were eating a pig and they thought they were vegetarian. And then they saw them using tools for the first time. And it was just completely, just your observation was completely changing everybody's perception of what primates were like. Yeah. Yeah, I remember, I grew up in the 70s. I remember as a kid, all the specials about Jane Goodall that would be on TV. Mm I do too. Especially using the tool to get the ants. Yeah. Yeah. And adapting, they they strip the leaves first. So they're they're altering the tool. (laughs) Yeah, she's been around a long time, and it's good to still see, you know, she's uh, still writing. Right, Patty, it's your turn. Okay, what, my Patty, turn. You go next. <laughs> I really enjoyed Juan Jose, I think it's Cuevas, mm-hmm. yeah, from Puerto Rico. Yes. Uh, his story, he was born and raised in Puerto Rico became a chef and came to the U.S. and had a very successful restaurant in 1919 is the name of the restaurant, Michelin Awards. And then he returned back to Puerto Rico in 2012 and discovered, I don't know if the hurricane brought this on or it happened before, but the hurricane of 2017 wiped out all the crops and they're so Puerto Rico, I guess, is so dependent on imports. And so he single, well, him and other chefs uh, diversified the agriculture there. Mm-hmm. Instead of growing just the plantains, let's see, I marked it down, the things they grow. Wasn't there cassava too? Yeah, yeah. So like, like big kind of more cash crop sort of things. Really, really starchy. Uh, cassava, plantains, green bananas, yucca, which are all super starchy. So he introduced more diverse, more modern carrots, beets, eggplants. I mean, tomatoes too. Kale. Um, Watermelon, so, shishito peppers. Yeah. 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 With the thought in mind of like, if this ever happens again, because you know, that was a devastation, that whole thing. And the administration that was in at the time. You know, so 
um, I just I just found myself I went through that interview so quick I found it so interesting did you guys think about um, our recent uh, power grid drama when you oh, were yeah. talking here oh yeah you know I didn't but um last year I think it Last year, I threw some chard in my front yard. Well, I threw several things in my front yard, just left over because I didn't fit in the backyard where I usually put things. And one of my tomatoes and one of my chard took off. In fact, my chard survived the week, and it's starting to come back. Wow. And I'll just go outside and grab a few leaves, and I'll do something with them. I have eaten more fresh chard than I have ever eaten in my life. And, um, you know, and it was that simple. You know, and he's doing that on a bigger scale, and I love that. And um, you know, that relationship between the restaurants and the growers right. um, to make that healthy for both of them. I like that. And then also coming back um, to feed, you know, to feed yes. the people just devastated. Yes. Yes. And they pooled together and made, you know, homey food, comfort yes. food yes. For, the, yes. for the people yes. that the Puerto Rican. And hot food when you when you've been stressed or you know without if they're cold and wet or having canned stuff all the time or whatever. Right. Fresh. He made yeah. fresh. He made a yeah. point of that. Yeah. It yeah. makes me want to just clean out my cupboard. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a nice segue into another chapter, which is Frances Mays. Okay. Did y'all read her? So Frances oh, yeah. Mays, uh, she's American. She's known for Under the Tuscan Sun. Um, which was made into a movie with Diane Lane and about her, uh, she was already an author, but moving to Italy, buying this old farmhouse. Um, I think she's still renovating it. <laughs> In this chapter, she talked about they didn't have a big garden this year because they were doing some um, renovations on their house. I think when you have a house that old, it's a constant project. But um, he talked a lot about the relationship with Italians and food. And, you know, there's a, a buzz phrase now that's popular here called farm to table. Well, Italy is the original farm to table. Probably a lot of European countries are. Where yeah, you're choppy for me. Pardon me? I'm sorry. Did it cut out? It froze just a minute. Oh, yeah, okay. for me. Okay. Okay. You said a catchphrase is the last thing I heard. Uh, what was the last thing? A catchphrase. Oh, catchphrase that we hear popular here, farm to table. Yes, where we use fresh ingredients. And I was saying that in Italy, they are the original farm to table. In Europe, in fact, is the farm to table. Everything's grown locally. She has a really funny story about going to the farmer's market. People have their own gardens, but then they also go to the farmer's market and she oh, yeah. peaches and she says, are these local? And the woman goes, oh, no, I'm sorry. They were grown in some little village and it's five miles away. Yeah. <laughs> but that's not local. <laughs> Yeah, I love um, that too. And just that connection to um, the seasons, to eating what's what's in season. Um, she said, you know, the, you know, the idea of Americans. She's happy now that that there's more farm to table and more fresh food being um, kind of highlighted in the restaurants. But she said, you know, the, the idea of people buying vegetables in a can in Italy um, in the grocery store. I mean, they might can things to preserve it, but that's not something that's very common. Yeah. Um, and then, I, have any of you seen, um, CNN's been doing a special with Stanley Tucci, Discovering Italy. So he, I was just watching that last weekend and I just finished this chapter. But one thing that she talks about in the book and also that you saw with him is that, um, so they love to forage. They love to look for things that you can't go to the store and buy. So mushrooms are a really popular thing to forage. But when they're looking for that, the particular mushroom that is like in season right now that I want to eat, while they're in the woods and Stanley Tucci was with this woman and she's showing him how to forage, she might see some other mushrooms and she's like, no, no, that's not the one I want. She's looking for the, the one that's in season. And she said the same thing, like the, the people, you'll see people out and you know by the time of year, oh, they're looking for this or they're looking for that because that's that's that season for that mushroom, that particular mushroom. Um, but I think I, the feeling I came away with that, she didn't talk so much about her um, like writing techniques, it was more of, again, like we talked about in the beginning, living a, living your life in a way that's satisfying and, and you feel happy. And I think that connection to food and, and seasons and things that are growing, I think that was a, a you know, really important point that she made. I also 
like the point that she made of the simpleness of the preparation of the food, the simpleness of the meals. It wasn't big, fancy, ornate. You know, it was fresh, yummy, simply prepared food. I liked that. Yeah, she let the food speak without a bunch of seasoning and especially the, um, what's that salad? Caprese. <laughs> love, love, love. Yeah, and they were, I think when they, in the interview, she was talking about what they, what was funny, because she said, we didn't have a very big garden this year because we're renovating the house. But then she went on to mention about 10 or 15 things that they were growing. And I'm like, well, for me, that would be my garden. <laughs> and then he says, oh, do you have lemons? And she goes, oh, yeah, and we have lemons. And, you know, <laughs> like every, you know, house in Italy, if you have a little land, she said, even if you have a little square, you're going to have basil and tomato and herbs and maybe an olive tree and maybe lemons. And then you can go forage for mushrooms. So. <laughs> But no, I, I, I like that a lot. I'd like to read her second book. I read Under the Tuscan Sun, but the second one, I don't recall the name. Mm -hmm. She has a cookbook out now as well. Oh, really? So she, she married, and you know, when she first went there, I think she was single, and then she, she married, and then her and her husband have, I think it's Under the Tuscan Sun cookbook that's hmm. really recent. Hmm. Under the Tuscan Sun was like, that's probably been almost 30 years, maybe. Does that sound right? It's been a while. It's that movie was, was a while ago, so. Yeah. I, I wanted that house so bad. Oh, I know. <laughs> yeah, she, they said um, she was describing her house, and she said, and she has a little balcony that she can, like, look out and kind of see what's going on. And he said, do you have a lot of tourists? And she said, yes, I think they're coming to look for Diane Lane. <laughs> <laughs> else who's someone else we should talk about before we wrap up um, well i'd like the final right which one um sylvia earl about the seas also in the pandemic watching nature videos i watched a um, nature documentary about her and the oceans now, and did you, already, you already knew about her did you well i had watched this documentary last year in the spring and that was the first i knew of her okay um she was new to me then but, but that was her and it was wonderful it was optimistic it was the power of individual decisions, uh, you know, collectively similar to kind of the, the feel of the Jane Goodall, but also bigger things and the importance of the ocean to all of us and how much we don't really understand or know about it completely yet. So I really liked that. Yeah, I really enjoyed that too. I'd never heard of her, but um, again, it just made me rethink. I love salmon and she was talking about it, you know, yeah. how probably the worst thing you can eat and i'm like oh <laughs> yeah she but... did do wild caught so keep that in mind oh wild caught okay. you can have farm salmon that's right i can do that no one. more shark fin soup no well that's not... <laughs> <laughs> yeah i really enjoyed her yeah so the picture of her she looks pretty young but in the very beginning they said you've been doing this for over 60 years yeah, so yeah. i guess that's not a current photo Either it's not a current photo or it's super flattering. <laughs> yeah, she was a young scientist in the 60s, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, I like she, you know, that he did ask about discrimination, and I don't know if it was like the Me Too movement, but she was like, yeah, that went on, but, you know, it didn't take, it didn't detract enough to keep her from doing what she wanted. Um, I like the point she's irrepressibly optimistic. Yeah. Nice. I was trying to think what she had said about that. Something that came up, I watched a lot of nature documentaries last year in the pandemic. Um, yeah. Richard Attenborough has a new one out as well. <coughs> and the point that he made and she makes as well is the world now is different than the world that they initially started studying as adults, as adults. Oh and yeah, they said, she said uh, yeah. something about people say I'm from another planet, yeah. but yeah. maybe I am. But yeah. I'm really from another planet because things have changed so much. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> it, it was really sad to read about the, the amount of plastic that the yes. sea life takes in. Yes. That's, that's yes. heartbreaking. Yes. That's yes. I did not watch that documentary about the giant plastic dump in the middle of the I did not watch that one. Yeah. <laughs> got time for one more. Patty, was there someone else that you wanted to focus on? Well, Dervla Murphy. Oh, she was fun. She was such a character. And yes. um, she was actually, let's see my little notes on her. 
She's an Irish travel writer, born in 1931. Um, she actually didn't start traveling um, until she okay. was about 30. She took yeah, it's like her early 30s, yeah. Ill mother, but when she did travel, she it says she bicycled uh, through Europe, at Iran and Afghanistan to India. So yeah. she on a bicycle by herself. So the book for that is Full Tilt, which I'm gonna definitely get. Yeah, I, me too, me too. Yeah, I definitely would love to read that. And then she comes back home to write and her process of writing, I thought this was interesting. She, um, she lives in a small town in Ireland and I don't have the name right offhand, but she will lock herself in. She won't even go out. She goes to the pub a lot apparently, but she won't even go to the pub because it'll distract from her notes and her vision of where she's going in her book, which I thought was really interesting. I love the description of when <clears throat> the, the author, when Michael Shapiro came to visit her and the meal that they ate, and then she invited him to stay in her little, I don't know if it's a guest room or a guest cottage, but it's called the Piggery. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I guess Michael Palin stayed there, one of mm -hmm. the... <laughs> Wouldn't she like to meet her? She just sounds so oh fun. Well, and today being St. Patty's Day, you know. Yeah. Right. Really, right. Um, well, I thought it was interesting. She talked about how in her writing, she's gone from just writing about the location to including the context and the setting. And that's kind of shifted some of her audience of her books. And um, I thought that was interesting. So it'd be interesting to see what she's written recently. The travel writer I've read the most of is a Paul Through, and um, it'd be interesting to see that, to how she handles that in different settings. Yeah, and one of her statements, I think I highlighted this, is as travel writers get older, they're no longer satisfied to write about the excitement of traveling. They're looking more below the surface, the human condition. So that, yeah, that's kind of what you were saying. Well, I hope for people that are watching this, uh, this will pique your interest in wanting to read this book because I, I really highly recommend it. I just think this was such a fun read. You guys agree? Yeah. I, I would also say, let everyone know there's lots of musicians. Yes. I love yeah. musicians. Ian Anderson, Merle Haggard. Oh, oh the Merle God. Haggard chapter was great. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't I, get that one. I got Lyle Lovett. He was a lot of fun. Well, Merle Haggard, I think he, this is the one where he talks about when he met Johnny Cash and he said, um, you know, I was at the Folsom prison concert and Johnny goes, well, I don't remember you playing. And he goes, no, I was an inmate. I was yeah. in the audience. <laughs> and he said, you know, everyone thinks that Johnny Cash is the bad guy, but really he's, he was, not, you know, he's not a bad guy. <laughs> yeah, even if you're not, I don't really know a lot of Merle Haggard music, but it was just really interesting. It didn't matter. <laughs> You can tell that Michael Shapiro is really a gifted interviewer because his yeah. subject seems so comfortable yeah. um, and they don't read like interviews. You kind of feel like you're a bug on the wall and people are just talking. Okay, I just got the little prompt saying we're running out of time. So <laughs> I want to thank both of you. Uh, this has been so fun. And then I want to let everyone else know the next um, book event that we're going to have here at the museum is going to be on April 22nd at 6 o'clock and it's going to be um, the Penguin Random House representative, Liz Sullivan, who's uh, been a reoccurring visitor. We had to do this uh, so fun. online she last fun. year, and we used to get to do it in person, but yeah, she's hilarious. And what she does is she'll bring um, book titles of books, you know, advanced reader copies of things that are coming out this summer, or books that are coming out this fall, to kind of give you an idea of, of some fun things that are, and usually it's a really wide array of fiction and nonfiction, and sometimes some YA. Um, so that will be April 22nd at 6 o'clock. Um, be sure and come back and, and visit that. All right. Just thank you. Okay. Good. Now, I know. I saw a lot of <laughs> thank you guys again so much. And we'll um, sometime this summer, we'll have another book coming out, too. So we'll be announcing that. And we always want to invite people. If you read the book, you're more than welcome to come join us on these Zoom uh, book buzz discussions. Or if we're back in person, then we would love to invite you to come to the museum. Thanks again. <laughs>